1965, David Bailey, already Britain's most fashionable photographer, took a portrait of the gangster twins Ronnie and Reggie Cray, who looked fiercely well-groomed in suits and narrow ties. At the time, they were not the notorious gangsters they were to become, but former boxers who ran nightclubs and collected protection money from people in awe of their reputation as a two-headed fighting machine. The portrait became Gangland's Mona Lisa. Copied, pirated and imitated, it was central to their image and their brand. They aspired to be as famous as Al Capone and Legs Diamond, and were gratified when one of Bailey's pictures of them, with their brother Charles, appeared later the same year in Bailey's box of pinups, his document of 1960s celebrity culture, alongside the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Rudolf Nureyev, Lord Snowden, and Gene Shrimpton. Their big mistake was posing for me, Bailey told the BBC last year. If you're a real gangster, nobody knows who you are. The Crays, of course, wanted everyone to know who they were. They may have been failures as professional criminals, but by the time they were sentenced to life in prison at the age of 35, their brand was already a phenomenal success. They spent half their lives behind bars. Ronnie died aged 61 in Broadmoor in 1995, and Reggie released very briefly from prison on compassionate grounds in 2000. Nonetheless, all these years later, the fascination with their story remains undimmed. The twins were fascinated by the movie mobsters of their cinema-going childhood. Their role model in England was a dashing gangster called Billy Hill, who in the 1950s exercised the same control over Soho as they would later over the East End. Hill modelled himself on Humphrey Bogart, holidayed in Cannes, and owned a club in Tangier, where the twins visited him in the 1960s and were impressed by his setup. One of Hill's friends was the crime reporter Duncan Webb, who ghosted his 1955 autobiography, Boss of Britain's Underworld. If Bailey's photo was the first stage in the construction of the Cray's enduring image, stage two came in 1967, when the Cray's approached John Pearson, a journalist who had just written a well-regarded biography of Ian Fleming and asked him to be their biographer, focusing on their clubs, their celebrity chums, and their charitable works. Truman Capote, who had just published In Cold Blood, had been their first choice, but he declined the commission. Pearson's The Profession of Violence, published in 1972, three years after the Crays were jailed for life, played a major part in the creation of their image, both through the richness of its prose and its unadorned revelations about their crimes. Throughout the late 1950s and early 60s, the Crays were carving out their reputation, sometimes literally, which they used both to make money and win attention. In 1954, they had taken over the Regal Billiard Hall in the East End, where Ronnie attacked members of a Maltese gang with a cutlass after they foolishly tried to extract protection money from him and his brother. Word spread about their capacity for violence, as there were always many witnesses to their beatings and carve-ups. By 1957, they had their own club, the Double R, and their own gang, known as The Firm, consisting of a mixture of London heavies, Scottish hard men, and bent businessmen. Gossip about the sheer scale of their violence travelled far. Ronnie branded one miscreant, the jewel thief Lenny Hamilton, with a white-hot poker for breaking the nose of a Cray associate, and ensured that they always got what they wanted whether it was a percentage of a club's takings, protection money from a pub or business, or a slice of another criminal's robbery proceeds. They moved westwards, taking over a gambling club, Esmeralda's Barn, which initially made them thousands of pounds a week. They felt like they were in the big time, even though the bank robbers of the era looked down on them as mere bullies, called them thieves ponces and Gert and Daisy behind their backs, claiming that they didn't steal their own money and attracted too many dodgy hangers-on. George Cornell, a gangster from South London, had called Ron a fat puff. Ron used to say, I'm homosexual, but I'm not a puff, and once, when Ron was drunk, had beaten him up. Ron was already suffering from paranoid schizophrenia, and on the 9th of March 1966, when he heard that Cornell was in the Blind Beggar pub, which was on the craze patch, he went round and shot him dead in front of shocked witnesses. The following year, Jack the Hat McVitie, who had also caused the twins some minor grief, 
was persuaded to attend a party in Stoke Newington, North East London, where Reggie stabbed him to death again in front of numerous witnesses. They thought their reputation made them untouchable, but the police, under Detective Chief Superintendent Leonard Nipper Reed, pursued them doggedly. The firm started to fall apart as its members gave in to police pressure and informed on the twins. In May 1968, Ronnie and Reggie Cray were arrested. Their Old Bailey trial the following year was, at 39 days, the longest murder trial in English legal history at that time. The press and public galleries were both packed. The twins denied everything, but the blind beggar barmaid, thereafter known as Mrs. X, gave damning evidence, and the renegade members of the firm did the rest. Ronnie gave a spectacular but crazed performance in the witness box, name-dropping the boxing champions they knew and portraying himself as an innocent East End philanthropist. They were jailed for life and a minimum of 30 years by Mr Justice Melford Stevenson, who told them that society has earned a rest from your activities. There was to be little rest from the twins, who continued to promote their image as England's number one gangsters so diligently. And that remains the great enigma about the craze. The fame they craved ensured that they would be a target for the police, and yet they staged their crimes where they would be guaranteed an audience. The men they believed were totally loyal were the ones who ensured their downfall. Once jailed, they devoted their considerable energies to their image as gangland stars, always open to visitors from outside. Their criminal empire may have been built on sand, but their name became a brand that retains its potency to this day for a nation both fascinated and repelled by the transgressive. Ronnie used to say, you should have been in my gang because I had, what is it, that forceful personality. Maureen Flanagan said when we met in July at her home near Broadway Market in Hackney, East London. Like many of the twins circle, Flanagan walked the line between the worlds of entertainment she was a topless model, appeared in Monty Python's Flying Circus, The Likely Lads, and The Benny Hill Show, and Crime as the confidant and surrogate little sister of the craze. Her memoir, One of the Family, was launched with a party at the Blind Beggar in July. She recalls how the Cray franchise established itself, how they used the notoriety from the trial, the kudos from the Bailey portraits, and the lurking menace they still inspired despite their incarceration, both to make money for their prison comforts and, even more important to them both, to ensure their immortality. Flanagan, who goes by her last name, was Violet Cray's hairdresser and first met the twins when they were polite young men popping in to see their beloved mum. After Violet died in 1982, Flanagan took on the role of prison visitor and go-between with the press. In the meantime, she had become a model, encouraged to enter the business by another young working-class photographer, Don McCullen, who had started to make his own name by taking moody pictures of young would-be gangsters for The Observer. He told me I looked like Shirley Eaton in Goldfinger and did my first modelling shots, said Flanagan, now 74. I had fabulous legs, so it always had to be in short skirts, sexy nurse, sexy secretary, and so on. I was in Monty Python's Hell's Grannies and chased round trees by Benny Hill. She describes the matriarch, Violet, as the classic gangster's mother, proud of her boys. There's nothing wrong I could say about this lovely lady, except that she totally spoiled them from birth. Flanagan did Violet's hair at her home in Valence Road, Fort Valence as it became known, in East London, because if she came to the salon, Violet, sitting under the dryer, would be pestered by people wanting the twins to have a word with someone on their behalf. By 1965, the twins had figured out how to turn their fearsome reputation into a source of income. The protection racket was their game, said Flanagan, but it wasn't just for money, it was for prestige, status. Ronnie loved celebrities. They brought over Joe Lewis, the former heavyweight champion of the world, and they would take him round the clubs and make him sign boxing gloves for people. Ron liked being in the company of George Raft, the American actor and star of the 1932 film Scarface, who was a director of the Colony Club, a West End casino. Then Judy Garland was in town and she had sung their mother's favourite song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. So the next thing for Ronnie was, we have to have Judy Garland in our presence. Garland was duly invited to tea with Mum, who was a little underwhelmed. She was a frightened little thing, 
too skinny, was Violet's verdict. At his trial, Ron cheerfully told the judge, if I wasn't here, I could be having tea with Judy Garland. British actresses Diana Dawes and Barbara Windsor were also courted by the craze and photographed with them. This cross-fertilization between crime and show business, exemplified in the US by Frank Sinatra's relationship with the Mafia, had benefits for both sides, prestige for the gangsters, edgy cool for the stars. Carried away by the ease with which the famous responded to their approaches, they summoned their high-profile biographer. They thought they would come out as good guys, said Flanagan. Flanagan visited the twins in prison faithfully, dealing with Ronnie's demands from inside Broadmoor, which included smoked salmon from Harrods and bagels from Brick Lane, plus gifts for the young prisoners who took his fancy. One of Flanagan's roles was to ring the Daily Mirror from a phone booth outside Broadmoor after a visit with tidbits about Ron. The paper would pay anything from £50 to hundreds of pounds for a story, depending on how big it was, and Flanagan would pass the money to their big brother, Charlie, who would share it with the twins. Flanagan would get a finder's fee. Broadmoor was a secure hospital rather than a prison, and the canteen could be used by inmates to order in expensive items from the outside world, which were put on tick. At one stage, Ron's canteen bill stood at £7,000. Ron's largesse was one of the reasons that the craze needed to capitalise on their name, and among the handy earners was the selling of media rights to his two weddings. In 1985, he wed Elaine Mildener, who had been writing to him in Broadmoor, as did many women, and visited him with Flanagan. Ron had been told that the son would be the best payers, and a fee of £20,000 was agreed, although only £10,000 was eventually paid. This gave the paper access to the wedding in the Broadmoor Chapel. Elaine soon found that her role mainly involved running errands for the Colonel, as he was known, and they divorced in 1989. She was swiftly replaced by a self-confident former kissogram girl, Kate Howard. The press were informed that they could have a brief interview with her, plus wedding photos and guest list. All offers for this exclusive to be in by the 10th of October and in excess of £25,000. The new bride, bubbly blonde Kate, soon appeared regularly in the tabloid press. That ended in divorce in 1994. But Kate Cray has done well out of the union. She has since written 19 books, mainly about gangsters, under her married name. Reggie's first wife, Frances Shea, committed suicide in 1965. In Maidstone Prison in 1997, he married 38-year-old Roberta Jones from Southport. When I met her at her home in Norfolk at that time, she was conscious that, by marrying a Cray, she had entered the media spotlight. It scares me. You are always aware that you might say something wrong. As with Kate, the Cray name opened the publishing house doors for Roberta. Eleven crime novels with titles such as Bad Girl, The Villain's Daughter and No Mercy have followed, with the word Cray featured prominently on the cover. Another of Flanagan's tasks when the twins were in prison was to help them organize charity events to which their name would be attached and which were a key part of their image. She would be tasked with getting George Best to sign a Manchester United shirt or the former world welterweight champion John H. Stracy to sign boxing gloves, which would be raffled or auctioned. The craze always took a good slice of the door money for any charity event. While their older brother Charlie was on the outside, he was expected to manage the brand. The brothers set up a company called Crayley Enterprises, which merchandised their name with everything from T-shirts Cray Twins on tour to cigarette lighters. Equally lucrative was the sale of their name to small security firms who would pay a few thousand pounds to be able to tell clients that they had the Cray's backing. The Cray's business cards still described them as personal aides to the Hollywood stars. Fifteen years after they were sent to jail, they provided bodyguards for Frank Sinatra when he visited Britain in 1985. To publicise legend, there is an exhibition at a gallery on Bethnal Green Road depicting the softer side of Cray life. Visitors will be able to enjoy a cup of tea in a replica of Violet Cray's living room, featuring family photos and 60s wallpaper, whilst experiencing an audiovisual installation of interviews with local people who knew or have knowledge of the Crays. The exhibition carries a statement from the film's director, Brian Helgeland, 
The East End is now a very different place where enterprise and design meet and the craze have slipped into the alchemy of legend. In July, he told The Guardian that he thought Reggie would consider his film fair and that Ronnie would enjoy being played by Tom Hardy. So yeah, all told, they would dig it. Of course they would. And they might echo the words spoken by their hero, the gangster Legs Diamond, in Harvey Fierstein's 1988 musical of that name. I'm in show business. Only a critic can kill me.